Please be seated. So today is a huge holiday and we, we just can't ignore it. So I'm, I'm just gonna say it right up front. Happy Transfiguration Day. <sighs> Did I surprise you? Um, I know that's not what you thought I was talking about, was it? But you know what? It's true. The Transfiguration is a high feast day across all of the church. And it's been celebrated as such for more than a thousand years. You see, this is it. It's the moment when the full force of God's glory is revealed in Jesus. It shines out like a, well, really a thousand watt stadium light that just cannot stay hidden inside of this gentle teacher and healer. Jesus is God's son. And you know what? We need to listen to him. The transfiguration is so important that our own Episcopal church calendar makes sure that the transfiguration has a yearly place in both the Sunday lectionary, which happens today, right before Lent, and then also in the calendar of holy days on a fixed day of August 6th. That means that, you know what, we could celebrate the transfiguration twice a year, every single year, if we wanted to. So where are the greeting cards and why isn't there a flurry of sales on, you know, like transfiguration theme flashlights or weeks of specials all up and down the bleach aisle in the weeks running up to this holiday? Well, it's not exactly an easy celebration to get our heads around. It's mysterious, it's really otherworldly. And, you know, it can be a bit confusing what with all of those appearance of long dead ancient prophets and booths and who knows what else. And you know what, speaking of mysterious and otherworldly, what about that Elijah story? I know we all know it from our children's Bibles that Elijah was carried off to heaven in that chariot of fire. But if you're like me, the details, they didn't always stick because I had to read through this story like three times this week as I was preparing for my sermon before I really got my head around it. It's, well, it's pretty circular, kind of like a spiral. This particular story you can tell was designed to be told by a storyteller around the campfire. And Elijah and Elisha are retracing the steps of God's people right back out of the promised land. They're reenacting in this act of remembrance. It's not that different from what we do when we do the Stations of the Cross. Every step of the way, there's this refrain, stay here, says Elijah. I will not leave you, says Elisha. Don't you know that God is taking Elijah, says some bystander. Shh, I know that, says Elisha. Somehow, Elijah and Elisha both know what's coming, just like we do. Elijah is going to be with God. He's going off in that chariot of fire. And Elisha will be the one to stay behind and become Israel's new prophet in chief. But they still go through those motions anyway. Elijah had had a really rough career as a prophet. He could have just given up a long time ago. And I think in the story, it's almost like Elijah is testing Elisha to see if he has what it takes to stick and to stay and to go through all of those inevitable frustrations and the rejection that goes with being God's chosen mouthpiece. But there is always more that God has in store for us, isn't there? Chariots of fire, well, they do not appear every day. Elijah knew this from his long walk with God. Every time Elijah was ready to throw in the towel, God was right there beside him, calling upon him to get up and to go proclaim God's word once again. Once God told Elijah to anoint Elisha as his successor, he was on that exact same journey. Every time they thought that they had seen, heard, and experienced all that there was to know about God, 
there was something more. God was forging a relationship and fulfilling a promise. They were his prophets and he was their God. And none of this was small, quick, or in any way straightforward. They had to revisit all of those places where God's promises had been fulfilled in the past. And then at each and every one, they had to choose to continue. They had to choose not to turn back. And they had to do this over and over in order to be able to have that incredible experience of transcendence that happens at the end of the story. And you know what? Here we are, Transfiguration Sunday, the day when we revisit twice every year that moment of transcendence that comes in Jesus's life that shines forth for us. But you know, after twice a year every year, it's possible for us to think, haven't we heard all there is to hear about the transfiguration by now? And we've heard a lot in the run-up to this week too. We have in fact heard Jesus's identity, ministry, and purpose as Messiah shown to us in the gospel readings for the whole five weeks of Epiphany. We've read about Jesus's baptism, the calling of the disciples, his teaching, his healings, and his exorcisms. But this direct revelation of the divine in Jesus, the one that we read about today, well, it's something else altogether. I find myself coming to Transfiguration Sunday thinking both, do we have to do this again? And also, well, what might we miss if we don't? Peter, James, and John might feel this way too. They have been following Jesus for some time now. They've heard his teaching, they've witnessed his miracles, and they've been right there on the front line for all of those healings. They've stumbled through this long journey trying to figure out just who is this man? What exactly is his relationship to God? And well, why are we so compelled to follow him? And you know, you have to wonder how many times had they thought along the way, I don't know what I'm doing here. Maybe I should just go home to my family and my fishing boats. Mark, of course, gives us the answer to who Jesus is and why we should follow him in nine little short terse chapters. But for those disciples, it could have been, well, several years of wandering and wondering. Mark's gospel makes the point that everything that Jesus did and said from the very day that he was born showed us that he was the Messiah, the son of God. It's as if Mark's entire gospel is epiphany after epiphany. It's, God, it's Mark showing the disciples and us what's right there in front of all of our eyes. God has come to meet us and invite us into his kingdom in the person of Jesus. So why does Mark hammer this point home over and over and over again? And you know, why do we need the transfiguration when the disciples and us have, well, we've got all the information now. I think maybe Mark is saying that we have to keep looking and keep on recognizing Jesus as the son of God over and over and over again. Or we might be tempted to think, there's nothing more here that I need to see. So since this is Scotts Valley and all of us live among the mountains, I'm guessing that there's some mountain climbers out there. For anyone who has ever climbed a mountain, I want to ask you all to reflect on the experience. Was it difficult? Did it take longer than you thought it would? Did you think you thought you knew what you would find at the top? Did the view surprise you? Did it take your breath away? And was there something along the way that you almost missed? When I was a college student in Galway, Ireland, I joined what was called the Hill Walking Society. Every Sunday morning, we would get on a bus and go out into Connemara to climb up one of the numerous mountains. This being the west coast of Ireland, it was wet. I mean, really wet. We needed good boots, 
because our feet would sink right in above our ankles into the boggy ground. We needed an even better raincoat because if it wasn't raining, it was spitting or misting or sheeting or some other mode of precipitation. I mean, I discovered modes of precipitation that I never knew existed in my California life. We couldn't always see more than a few feet in front of us, in fact. I see some of you laughing. I think some of you recognize this weather pattern I'm describing. So for the first month or more that I went, I'd reach the top of that mountain or hill or whatever you call it. And I would just find myself completely surrounded by clouds. It was like no view whatsoever. I can admit that I started to question my sanity in putting myself through this weekly wet slog. I mean, I could have slept in on Sunday morning. To be honest, after a few Sundays, it was really only the pint of Guinness and the blazing peat fire in the pub at the end that kept me showing up for that 9 a.m. bus. I actually thought I had seen everything there was to see on a mountaintop in Ireland. And I was beginning to think that I had better things to do with my Sunday mornings, like sleep, study, or, you know, maybe even go to church. Then, one Sunday, as we started up that mountain, it was like a miracle occurred. We were surrounded by clear blue sky. When I hit the top of that mountain, I couldn't believe what I saw. It was like rolling away from me for miles and miles and miles was every last one of those hills that I had slogged up and down in the clouds Sunday after Sunday. They rolled down this long peninsula, and I had no idea how far one could actually see from a mountaintop when there's no trees. But you know what the most amazing thing was? It was that on all three sides of me, like literally surrounding me, there was ocean. Now, what had always felt like a closed in, bleak, wet, and isolated hilltop was really this incredibly long, narrow finger of land that was just reaching straight out into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I'll never forget that view. It's the kind of thing that challenges me to take pause every time that I think I know all there is to see about something or someone. An epiphany is seeing something in a new way that was there all along. In the transfiguration, we finally see with full clarity what was evident in all that we know about Jesus' life up to that point. God and Jesus are one. Jesus was transformed into God. His appearance changed for a few brief moments, showing Peter, James, and John God's full love and glory that was right there inside of him all along. It's something that they maybe hadn't quite seen not because it was hidden, but only because there was still more for them to discover first. If they had gone back to their fishing nets months ago, they would have completely missed out. They would have never quite realized that in Jesus was God right there, working to transfigure this world and to be part of God's presence here. Christians, well, I think we need a regular and healthy dose of transfiguration. It reminds us of this amazing promise. Every time that we look at the world and see it just the way it is, well, we are tempted to think that we understand all there is. We know how things work. We've seen it all before and nothing, well, nothing really seems like it's getting much better, does it? We're actually not that different from the folks being addressed in our reading from Paul's second letter to the church he founded in Corinth. They're finding it harder and harder to live as Christians in a pagan world. And they're considering giving up on Paul to follow some flashier evangelists who promised them a much easier path. Paul admits that the power of the gospel may not always be visible. It can sometimes seem like it's hidden to our eyes but he draws upon the strength of the same kind of revelatory experience that Peter and James and John's had at the transfiguration 
to call them back to a path of discipleship and hope in Jesus. Don't forget that it is in the face of Jesus that we can see God's glory shine, Paul's telling them. He's adamant. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ at Lord, as Lord. And it is the God who said, let light shine in the darkness who has shown in our own hearts. We all need these transfiguration moments, those little tiny flashes when we are so sure of God's presence and love and purpose in our lives. They put all of those pieces back together for us and compel us to get up and to cry out, even if we were about to give up on our call in the world. I have to confess, I almost didn't watch the inauguration last month. I mean, I was so tired of the mess that we had worked ourselves into as a country and that, well, daily dose of how much more crazy can things get today. I miss the arrivals, I miss Lady Gaga, and I missed J-Lo. But Luke got me to tune in just in time for the swearing in. And you know what? Boy, am I glad that I did. You see, after the speeches, there was this elegantly dressed poet named Amanda Gorman. She was little more than a girl and her words, well, they just lifted me up. They told me something that I know I really needed to hear. When the day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid, the new dawn balloons as we free it, where there is always light, if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. We haven't seen it all before. So keep on climbing those mountains with Jesus on your own lifelong journey. There's always another epiphany waiting in the wings, something more that God has in store for each and every one of us. Amen.